Welcome back to another Engineering Alloy Seminar. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Peter Felfer from FAU in Germany. Um, so Peter is an expert in atom probe tomography and he has published um, many, many papers on the use of atom probe in metals and oxides and other materials as well. So I'm sure most of us here are very excited to learn more about atom probe. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Peter. Uh, hi, Jess uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, unfortunately, of course, right now it's not really possible to be in London in person, but um, London is actually, in terms of travel, one of the closest universities, uh, university towns to Erlangen because we've got a direct flight that takes 50 minutes. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to get to go uh, sooner or later. Anyway, so today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, single atom analysis of transient in an environment environmentally unstable states. So this has really been something that's been near and dear to our heart in the last uh, couple of years, meaning that we expand the range of analysis from our usual approach of having a sample that's reasonable, stable at environmentally conditions, um, doing some preparation, putting into a microscope and doing the analysis to materials that are just can't expose to either air or room temperature, uh, or anything like that. And there's a couple of materials where this is actually interesting and I'll go into that. Uh, and what that actually demands is quite a lot of instrument development because a lot of the, the um, instruments that are necessary or equipment that is necessary to do that kind of work doesn't currently exist or didn't exist, it exists now. Um, yeah, and so quite a lot of work uh, went into developing all of that. Uh, and um, out of this came a very nice lab. So this is actually two of my instruments here, field iron microscope and one of the atom probes that we operate. Um, and yeah, they were all custom built machines really geared towards uh, solving specific uh, for specific problems. Um, and with that, I actually want to thank uh, everyone that, that paid for all of that work and that helped me out in, in, in getting, especially getting started in the uh, in building your own equipment because it, that obviously wasn't super easy and it demands quite a lot of investment in in in, uh, uh, in equipment as well, of course. So uh, the main one of the main sponsors here is of course the ESC that have paid for my. Uh, big new atom probe, uh, but also there is some uh, some larger uh, German research initiatives uh, that have contributed quite a lot. And uh, also something that I really always need to mention is that the atom probe community is very, very welcome, uh, and especially the people that have been building up equipment for longer uh, periods of time, uh, like uh, Patrick Stender in Stuttgart or the entire group in Rouen, have been extremely helpful uh, in, in building all of that equipment. And also, uh, I've been very lucky to have a workshop where I can just, you know, come up with an idea, go over there, have something made, and it doesn't cost me an arm and a leg. Um, anyway, so the, the main motivation, of course, in doing that kind of analysis is that if we look at engineering materials, usually the microstructure knows the answer to all of our questions that we might wish to ask, and it exists at the atomic scale. So we have a variety of, of, of crystal defects usually to determine the properties of our materials uh, or, uh, serve, or also surface oxidation or coating uh, features. Um, and if we really want to interpret what their effect is, we need to know what they look like at the atomic scale. So this can be things like grain boundaries, dislocations, um, surfaces like uh, surface oxidation and so on and so forth. Um, and atom probe tomography is actually a fairly good tool uh, to look at that. It's not the only tool, but it's a fairly good tool. Um, and especially if we can combine it with other tools, it uh, very often actually gets us pretty close to the uh, question that we want to answer. The thing about atom probe tomography is I'm pretty sure by now you're all fairly familiar uh, with the with the principle. I mean, you've been successful in you know getting enough uh, money in to get a quite uh, uh, stellar um, set of uh, equipment into Imperial as well. Uh, and the boundary condition is essentially that we operate at very, very, very high vacuum, so ultra high vacuum to extreme high vacuum. So our machine is the first one now uh, operating extreme high vacuum, so below 10 to the minus 11, uh, and usually between, say, say 10 and 60 Kelvin. <clears throat> 
and of course, this is not really uh, an environmental condition, and um, we want to get as close to those final measurement conditions in our transfer as well, so that we can stabilize certain material um, states. Yeah. And you know already how the whole 3D precision reconstruction works and the identity uh, determination and so on and so forth. The good thing is, of course, that we get all chemical elements. And now for our new machine, that's actually fully true. So we get all chemical elements. Uh, we're inherently quantitative uh, with a near atomic resolution, but with a sort of limited field of view of about 100 by 100 by maybe a couple of hundred nanometers. And um, so in my um, in my uh, lab, we operate a number of instruments uh, to that end. Um, and those are partially preparation instruments. So we've got a couple of FIBs. We've got three FIBs in total, uh, two of those that we use for atom prop tomography uh, sample preparation. Uh, one of them has a cryo system built in that we have expanded to be able to go into the atom probe straight from the FIB. Uh, then we have a commercial atom probe, um, which is a LEAP 4000, uh, which we also have done a cryo conversion with. So obviously the LEAP itself, uh, so the, the instrument itself has a cryo head, so it's cold already, but we can go in cold as well. Uh, and we have a cold and heat treatment stage uh, that we can, uh, a cold stage and heat treatment stage in there that we can use to transfer samples in, store them cold, We'll also heat them up and do uh, some funky experiments that way. Um, then we have, and this was supposed to blob up later, then we have a field iron microscope, uh, which is also cryotransfer capable. Uh, and we have a, a special titanium atom probe, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, and we have a new uh, mystery uh, pulse laser atom probe. I'll show you some uh, first uh, results from that thing. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk too much about how it works simply because uh, we might choose uh, to do something with the IP that comes out of that. Uh, so in my group, what we, do, what we do in the end is we think about what kind of experiment do we want to do? And if it's possible to do a commercial instrument, we obviously use that if we can, uh, but we are willing to dip into any level of depth if, co if commercial instrumentation doesn't uh, fulfill the requirements that we have. Um, on our measurements. Uh, and yeah, sometimes you just have to challenge yourself and uh, get in and see what you can get out of your instrumentation. And our start with that was actually a uh, field iron microscope. Um, and a uh, field iron microscope has turned out to be very useful for imaging of materials with single atom sensitivity, um, especially where you want to go to the actual atomic level and look at individual atoms. It's sometimes very helpful. Um, we haven't published much on that yet, but uh, we've now uh, upgraded our film to be 3D ready. Uh, and the reason for that is that in field iron microscopy, uh, the best imaging voltage, which is Fi here, and the field evaporation voltage are not usually the same. Uh, so just, in atom, just like an atom probe, it's very helpful to have a pulse to be able to sort of get rid of atoms, so go into 3D and at the same time have the best imaging voltage. Um, that machine is in principle and now also atom probe ready, so it just needs an atom probe detector. I don't know if uh, it has two ports, so we still have one uh, vacant port to be able to do that. Um, maybe we'll do that at some point as well, but for now we only use it for field iron microscopy. And you can see here, this is now the new pulse line that we have that allows us to, uh, to do some high voltage pulsing. And here's some, uh, you know, if you do FIM, you always need to show some tungsten. Uh, but what we are more interested in is things like supra alloys, where we want to look at rhenium distributions uh, or um, tungsten alloys or uh, tungsten materials uh, that are used in things like uh, nuclear fusion and the like. But after a while, you get caught up in it uh, and you start building a lot more equipment. Um, and the equipment that we've most worked on is actually the, the equipment to work on environmentally sensitive states. So what are environmentally sensitive states? They're essentially material states where either room temperature diffusion, uh, oxidation, or some kind of phase transformation uh, will impede you um, to prepare your sample and investigate it if you don't have the right equipment to be able to uh, yeah, to to make your sample and to get it into your uh, into your analysis system 
which usually for us means atom prop, but not always. Um, and the, the things we're working on currently is uh, looking at hydrogen in materials. I'll get into that much deeper later. Uh, looking at room temperature clustering in aluminium alloys, because that's a very important topic for us on the engineering side. Um, then things we can also do is looking at fast oxidizing materials like zigonium based alloys and the like, which, you know, if you leave them at uh, ambient conditions, they will just oxidize within minutes. Um, or things like catalysts where surface state changes would actually completely alter what you observe uh, if you expose them to oxygen. Um, on the phase transformation side, we're looking at things like uh, microfluidic systems, especially um, especially fuel cells uh, where you know water ingress and water getting the water out is actually uh, an important performance measure and we can freeze that in and then do tomography on it that's obviously FIP tomography and not atom prop tomography um, and we're looking at uh, materials that would be liquid uh, at room temperature or are close to like gallium or, or you can start looking at things like lithium as well uh, and this is in, uh, especially interesting for people in chemistry. Uh, and so the question is, how do we keep the material in its original state for analysis? And the, the way we do that is actually by freezing in material states through cryo preparation. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, developed a complete cryo transfer cryo transfer system uh, where we can uh, go from the uh, FIPSEM. So in this case, this is the Zeiss FIPSEM that we have because that's the one where we have the uh, cryo stage in, and uh, then we can go through a load lock and transfer it into an actively cooled transfer device. So this is the FIP transfer device, actively cooled transfer device, uh, where we can transfer at about uh, minus 160 degrees Celsius uh, and about 10 to the minus 6 millibars. Uh, so not ultra high vacuum, but okay vacuum, not to get uh, so you won't get frost or anything. Uh, and we can use that to go into the LEAP or the or the, the titanium atom probe or the FIM or some other sample preparation equipment that we have. Uh, so currently I've got some leftover iron getter pumps and valves, so we're also going to build one for ultra high vacuum transfer, but it's not really that higher priority for us right now. Um, and things we've done with that already is, uh, for example, 3D tomography of a catalyst laden and that making out fuel cell, um, or doing 3D imaging of catalyst layers using ionic liquids. Uh, where you freeze everything in and then it goes slice and view and uh, you can get, get a 3D reconstruction. Uh, we've also done ice cream, by the way, but that's not for publication. That's was that was just for fun. Um, and we are currently working on uh, on uh, liquid metal catalysts, uh, where in chemistry there is uh, quite a lot of questions about um, how they develop chemically on the individual uh, catalyst particle basis over time when they're when they're used, for example, for uh, for hydrogenation reactions. And with the atom probe, we can look into that whole problem pretty easily uh, once you've figured out how to prepare the, the gallium uh, without it uh, melting. And uh, the good thing about our system is also it's approved for uh, for pregnant ladies up to the to the ninth month. So this is my uh, uh, my postdoc, my group leader, Chandra. Who was operating the atom probe pretty much un up until uh, operating the cry transfer system pretty much up until the last day before she went into maternity leave. Um, yeah, so one low hanging fruit in this case that you can think of is actually what happens at these low temperatures if you try to shoot gallium at aluminium. So usually, if you do that, the aluminium at the gallium will just diffuse at the grain boundaries and lead to liquid metal embrittlement. You know, one of the reasons why you are not allowed to take gallium onto an airplane because you know you can essentially turn it into uh, the, the into something where you can push your finger through the outer hull. Um, and it turns out if you work at cryogenic temperatures all the way through, you can actually prepare your samples from aluminium just using a gallium-based fib, and uh, you won't get any uh, diffusion of the gallium at the grain boundaries. It just see some enrichment here, which just simply comes from the fact that we do iron implantation and we have different crystal orientations, uh, but no um, no real gallium liquid metal embrittlement. Um, something that might be a little bit more interesting is actually looking into the very early clustering in aluminium alloys. It's been a topic that's been around for quite a long time, uh, but uh, the issue has become a lot more pressing in recent years because these alloys. Uh, 
cluster hardening alloys are going into car body applications now. Um, and this is because they cluster harden during the pain bake cycle. And the pain bake cycle is now being temperature reduced to about 165 or 160 degrees Celsius, where regular precipitation is just not fast enough to, to harden the aluminium alloy. Uh, and here we, through triggered release of vacancies, you can actually essentially create diffusion on demand. The question for this with these alloys is still unanswered is how does the clustering actually work in there? Uh, and the problem with that is that they cluster at room temperature. So you have to think about ways to prepare your sample uh, without uh, it showing any previous clustering. And the first answer we were going after is actually, is the uh, distribution of the atoms still random after we do the, the quenching? And for that, we've built a cryo-electropolishing setup where we can uh, electropolish our samples at minus, uh, minus 50, minus 66 degrees at all times. Uh, and with that, we were able to show that if you cryopolish, you get a truly random solid solution, at least random within the, the bounds of the of the uh, detector efficiency of the atom probe we've used here. So this is still our commercial atom probe, which has a detector efficiency of about 37%. Our new atom probe is closer to 80% or above 80%, then obviously uh, this can be revisited with a higher accuracy. Um, more important work for us though is how do we measure hydrogen in the atom probe? Um, and atom probe tomography as a time of flight mass spectrometry method is uh, in principle equally sensitive to all elements. But hydrogen uh, comes in from the vacuum system and it occludes hydrogen from the sample. And so far people have been uh, using deuterium uh, tracers as a workaround but it's only a okay K for some fundamental research. So if you do aluminum, you would still uh, have an interference with a hydrogen two peak. So that doesn't really work. Um, but for steels and superalloys and the like, it works kind of okay. But of course, then you're limited essentially to electrochemical charging, because if you want to do gas charging, you need a lot of deuterium, uh, unless you charge at conditions that are not really close to real world conditions. Um, and uh, But we've also started out with Ethereum, uh, electrochemical charging. So we have a charging cell where we have D2O with KOD, uh, something that's uh, been uh, used quite extensively also by the Oxford group. Um, and then we transfer into the atom probe within less than 10 minutes uh, and already cold um, so that we can, uh, we can actually uh, impede much of the loss of the, of, of, of the hydrogen from the material. With that, we can see, for example, at grain boundaries, we get massive amounts of uh, deuterium, massive amounts of hydrogen, um, and we start uh, and we can start analyzing the amounts of uh, hydrogen there. Um, it turned out that uh, that's a little bit hard to reproduce if you go and uh, if you go and look at all kinds of different grain boundaries. You always have the question of what the grain boundary character um, is about. Uh, so we also needed to determine a cryo lift, uh, need to, to develop a cryo lift out method so that we can not just use, you know, some um, cold drawn wire where you get a lot of grain boundaries, but go and look at grain boundaries that we deliberately lift out, lift it out. Um, and so we started looking at one and the, uh, at the same grain boundary at uh, different times after hydrogen charging. And what you can see is that in the beginning, you get a lot of hydrogen and a lot of the hydrogen leaves, but quite a fair bit of the hydrogen stays as well and it starts clustering at the grain boundaries. So this is uh, obviously very early days in that research, but it kind of looks like the, uh, the old uh, theories of uh, hydrogen bubble formation might actually have some truth to them, even though they've been not as popular over the last couple of years as other hydrogen damage mechanisms. Um, but by the way, this is all pure iron. Uh, yeah, we see quite significant differences if we have any kind of um, grain boundary segregation, especially if we've got carbon at the grain boundaries, uh, we see some quite uh, different behavior uh, in terms of grain boundary clustering, but that's something for a later date. Um, that's also been, uh, that's all been pioneered by my uh, PhD student Martina Heller, who's really spent a lot of time developing a lot of those cryo system things and uh, the special the cryo lift out as well. Uh, but still, this approach is pretty good for verification of fundamental mechanisms. 
Uh, but of course, uh, what we really want to do is measure hydrogen directly, uh, because then you can get into the business of taking in-service components and components that are in in regular, um, uh, in, in also in regular investigations like fuel cells uh, and the like, uh, where it's just impractical or just prohibitively expensive to use deuterium. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back is a fake hydrogen peak and uh, that's not quite correct. Usually we get more a couple of thousand. So this is this is only for uh, uh, for some uh, for some limited steels. What we want is actually something with less than 10 atomic ppm, um, so that we can do imaging pretty freely. Um, the problem with that is that the hydrogen content in standard austenitic stainless steel is about uh, 56 atomic ppm, and uh, that's just out gases at a rate of about. 0.1 millibar liters per square, uh, sorry, about 10 to the minus 11 millibar liters per square centimeter. And if you have a typical atom probe chamber, you know, that's 6,000 liters per second, that's something you're not going to be able to pump out uh, as quick as uh, you need to if you don't want any interference. But people have uh, thought about that before, especially in the uh, atomic clock community and in the uh, accelerator community. They've come up with a variety of ways of uh, trying to get rid of the hydrogen that's in the chamber. Uh, and you can do things like vacuum firing or coating. But in the end, that's all uh, not really good enough for us. Uh, so what we've done is actually uh, the, uh, a complete titanium design. So our atom probe is actually made completely from titanium. Uh, all of the metal parts essentially that don't need to be highly thermally conductive. So we've got some copper parts in there as well. Um, and we've got some polymer parts where we need to have uh, thermal insulation and uh, uh, electrical insulation at some, uh, uh, in, in some locations. But everything else is titanium. Um, and that really allows us to go to ultra low vacuums essentially to vacuums where the vacuum is no longer measurable for us. Um, um, measurable for us with this uh, cold cathode gauge, it's the same one that you will find in a lot of uh, atom probes out there. Uh, obviously, you can go and use some extractor type uh, cold hot cathode gauges or some uh, quadrupole mass spectrometry devices where you can measure lower pressures. But the problem with that is that um, they tend to spit out some hydrogen because they have hot filaments. Uh, and so we uh, we just stick with that one and um, assume that our measurement is a better vacuum gauge than anything else anyway. Uh, we want some high spectral and spatial performance. Uh, we want a high detection efficiency, but that's also that's just something you pay for when you buy when you buy a detector. Uh, we want a flexible vacuum system, and the whole thing is also laser ready, uh, and it has a microelectrode. Um, and um, with a flexible vacuum system, what I mean is that we have a path to go in cryogenically, so we can go in cold, or we can also heat treat our specimens. Yeah? So we've got two different paths to go in, um, which also allows us to do effusion experiments just like we can do on our uh, leap atom probe right now as well. Uh, and so how does the whole thing work? So we've been acquiring data on this machine now for a little while. Um, and I can confirm that we can actually uh, use it to image hydrogen. So it's a um, it actually has ultra low hydrogen background throughout most of the experimental conditions. And I'll get into that in the next slide. Uh, so here you can uh, see a comparison between our titanium atom probe at the top and a conventional leap atom probe. Uh, the difference in mass spectrum fidelity is uh, due to the fact that this is a a reflection based machine and this is a straight flight path machine uh, and what you can see here is that we have about 170 ppm hydrogen uh, in the um, in our titanium atom probe and if I take the same specimen so this is data from the same specimen uh, and move it into the leap and uh, wait for the same amount of time I've waited here in terms of pumping down uh, I'll get about a factor of 100 higher hydrogen uh, content in the data. But uh, something that's also been a little bit surprising to us is that also the oxygen containing species go up. So uh, we do not see any oxygen containing species in the uh, um, in the titanium atom probe. Uh, 
uh, whether we see, whereas we see some in the convention that on purpose. I think that's probably because uh, there is always some residual water, uh, which you get if you introduce oxygen. It will combine with the hydrogen in the chamber wall and create water. Yeah? Uh, and then it will decompose during the field of operation. Uh, and I guess that's where the oxygen containing species mostly come from. Yeah? And we don't see that here as well. Um, the spatial resolution, uh, well, that's just owing to the detector that we bought. The detector has 60 micron spatial resolution. Uh, if you go with a 10 to the 6 uh, magnification, um, then that's uh, that's 60 picometers. No, 60 picometers, 600 picometers. Anyway, plenty good enough resolution. Yeah. Um, and so you can see that if we measure tungsten, we can see all the uh, all the different individual atomic planes. But yeah, that's not that's not a big um, that's not a big surprise anyway. Um, so what does the whole thing quantitatively look like uh, for a variety of different materials? Well, the first thing we can say is up to about six kilovolts of uh, specimen bias. Uh, we do not observe any uh, hydrogen, any amount of hydrogen that's above the background. Um, in high field specimens like uh, tungsten, we don't see any hydrogen full stop. No? Uh, but in nickel, you know, with, at, this is all at 7 kV, you would get, you know, a couple of ppm uh, compared to a couple of hundred in the, uh, um, um, in the leap. Uh, and for aluminium, you know, it gets maybe 100 to 200 ppm, um, which again is about a factor 100 less than in the leap. Um, I think the reason why we still get some hydrogen is because there's one larger uh, stainless steel part left, uh, which is the cryo interface here. Uh, and we're currently working to get that replaced either with a, a titanium nitride coated part uh, or with a part made from uh, titanium it's, uh, from titanium as well. Uh, so I guess in the next couple of months this is going to go and then the residual hydrogen is going to go as well. Um, the reason why I say up to 6 kV is because you do have some dependency of the amount of hydrogen on the measurement voltage. So, you know, it goes up uh, essentially, uh, with a uh, with a uh, with a power law, yeah. uh, but if we're below six kV, it's uh, not really measurable for us at all. And with a microelectrode atom probe, you can actually acquire quite a lot of data before you get to six uh, kV. Uh, yeah, so currently we're actually upgrading the instrument. Um, the reason for that is that most selective losses in atom probe tomography come from the analog front end. So essentially, an atom probe detector kind of can be compared to like if you have a very uh, a very still pond and you throw a pebble in it, and then you're trying to figure out where and when the pebble hit the the pond by looking at when the waves arrive at the shore. If you have one pebble, that's all, uh, all all fine. But if you throw in you know a couple of pebbles at the same time, it gets a little bit complicated uh, in terms of um, when and where they hit because you get a lot of waves. And the problem with current analog front ends is you only get like a ping per each wave. So if you've got two that are overlapping, you're not going to be able to see that. And at that time is between 5 and 20 nanoseconds right now. Um, and I think on a Kamika it's closer to 20. Why? I'm not quite sure. Uh, and if you want to go analog, it can just digitize the entire waveform. So this is essentially one of those pulses, one of those waves as it hits the shore. Um, and that drastically improves multi-hit capacity. Um, so if you look at that uh, graph here, so this is an actual digitization. This is all actual digitizations from our detector, uh, which is a, a very good PCB-based one. So it's not a like wire coil uh, wound one anymore. Uh, and you can see that it's about four and a half nanoseconds of uh, pulse width that we get. Now, um, it takes about one nanosecond per millimeter of detector space for this wave to travel. Um, and so you can see that if you know if you want to have something that's closer than a millimeter together, then you need to be able to distinguish between about one nanosecond. And with digitization, that's pretty possible. Uh, the goal is obviously to go below 0.2 millimeters because that's roughly uh, when, you, when you're below one atomic spacing in the material. Uh, at a 10 to the 6 magnification, and then uh, the overlaps are essentially fully resolved, uh, unless you take into account 
some conditions where you get some pretty bad field overlaps. Yeah, but for the most part, then they are resolved. Uh, and right now, you know, we're doing this uh, with our oscilloscope at a very slow pace, but uh, in the near future, we're going to have a digitizer uh, to do that at essentially normal experiment rates. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is actually our mystery pulsed laser atom probe that we've been uh, working on that's actually online now. Uh, and so there we, uh, we, we're asking ourselves, can we do better than thermal? So right now, if you do laser atom probe tomography, you're shooting a short laser pulse into your sample that gets absorbed and heats your sample. And this is a heating effect essentially that gives us the uh, ability to, to field evaporate the samples. The downside with that is, of course, that there's a reason why we cool the sample down in the first place, because all kinds of nasty things happen once uh, you start heating up the sample. Uh, there can be uh, evaporation of cluster ions, so you don't get one atom coming off anymore, but a couple of atoms at a time. Uh, then you get surface diffusion can happen. Um, at the, uh, the whole magnification, uh, local magnification uh, issue gets worse. Yeah, whole, whole lot of bad things that happen. Uh, but right now we put up with it because we don't have anything better. Uh, and the question is, can we do any better? And for that, we explore new laser technology. Again, right now, I'm not really allowed to talk about what the technology is, but it's pretty funky. Uh, and it's uh, essentially inventions by our colleagues over at Laser Physics. Uh, Peter Homelhoff is someone that's uh, pretty famous in the in the area of shooting lasers at tiny tips, probably the, person, the best person in the world to do that. Um, and the first experiments were very encouraging. As you can see here, this is a straight flight path instruments with, with 120 millimeter flight path length. Uh, and this is the kind of mass resolution that we get out of it uh, for tungsten. So very, very high mass resolution that we don't really get if we uh, work on a thermal uh, scale. And this is all still at room temperature. Uh, I've designed a cooling that we've uh, put in. So experience with cooling uh, will start this week. And uh, we're very, very excited about this. So stay tuned and see if that actually turns out or uh, turns out to work well or maybe it turns out to not give us any advantage. I don't know yet, we don't know yet. Um, the last thing I wanna show you is that we've also thought about what to do with the data. And for that, we've uh, developed a toolbox for high volume data processing. So essentially, uh, we ask ourselves the question, what if you don't wanna look at a single data set anymore, but what if you wanna look at 100 data sets, 200 data sets, 300 data sets, or maybe even 10,000 data sets? And for that, you need a framework where you can do the whole thing programmatically rather than with a user interface. And for that, we've developed our Atom Pro Toolbox, which is an open toolbox, uh, open source toolbox uh, written in MATLAB, which can be used for advanced mass spectrum analysis. So we have the ability to label ions and uh, and um, and ranges and so on and so forth, and also have databases on ions that we that we also provide. Um, and this will uh, enable us to do some uh, some more precise uh, mass spectrum quantification, uh, especially in combination with uh, digitizers that you know minimize the losses of uh, of ions uh, based on the um, based on the relative isotopic um, uh, abundances. Um, and also that allows for advanced spatial analysis. So. Uh, using closed loop reconstruction methods, using anti-mapping methods, uh, and also kernel-based analysis. So you can use the entire analysis framework and write any kind of custom analysis that you would like uh, to quantify anything you're interested in your end probe data. And this sort of gives you the framework so you then need to start from scratch and you can do everything programmatically. So you can do it on a lot of data sets uh, in, a short, uh, in short succession. Um, we're going to have a, uh, so we already had an Atom Prop software school on that toolbox in November, I believe. Uh, and there's going to be another uh, one pretty soon because there was quite a lot of people asking us about interface analysis. So we're going to do a special interface analysis day. And then later in the, uh, in probably early summer, we're going to do a reconstruction day as well. Okay, uh, and with that, I just want to summarize that, yeah, new instrumentation brings lots of new possibilities. Um, hydrogen free atom probe tomography is possible. We can do that now, uh, and maybe even a thermal laser pulsing. 
Uh, if you uh, want to know anything about our programs, uh, you can actually go on my YouTube channel. Just uh, type my name into YouTube and you will find it pretty easily. Uh, and uh, you can also just go on my GitHub. Uh, all of the code that we use is on my GitHub. You can just download it and use it uh, as you wish. And I just realized I also should have put in the link to the uh, YouTube of the International Field Emission Society. So I'm currently also organizing a lecture series that is supposed to help uh, new people in the field of atom probe tomography getting started. Um, some lecturers are still owing me their uh, presentations, but the first one by Professor Blavet from Rouen, which is sort of an introduction to atom probe tomography, also a little bit with historic background, uh, that's already available. And I think that's already a pretty good start for people to just, you know, uh, get the first one and a half hours of watch time on uh, atom probe YouTube. I guess right now everyone's uh, locked up at home anyway, uh, so that's probably uh, a pretty good, uh, pretty good one and a half hours that you can spend on something useful. All right, uh, and that's it for me. I think uh, half an hour. I didn't go too much over time. Hopefully, yeah. So if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, answer anything. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the really interesting talk. So yeah, um, are there any questions? Fantastic seminar. Thank you, Peter. Ah, I think I think Bat has a question. I'm appreciating Pickle Rick, by the way. <laughs> what 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 makes you think it's a thermal? Right now? Um, yeah, but because right the mass now... resolution is not really different to what we would get normally. And you have these strong peaks at whatever 120, which are probably Tungsten two three plus right, and so yes. that is a, a, a typically what we find when we go actually very high in laser power. Yes, uh, so right now the uh, um, the thing that makes us think that it might be a thermal is that okay, I shouldn't talk too much about the technology, but essentially the amount of power that you put in wouldn't be enough to trigger a uh, to trigger a thermal response. That that was the premise of my PhD thesis, which proved completely wrong. So that's well, why I'm, I'd be quite careful. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying. Uh, we, obviously, this is not the 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 answer to all questions. Where we the other thing is about this was done at room temperature. So the room temperature's charge state distribution actually fits perfectly with what, what would happen at room temperature. Yeah. Um, this is the other hint, but we don't have solid proof. And we have only had the cooling put in last week, so the exciting experiments are only starting now. And yes, I think there is also a good chance that uh, just like in your thesis, we'll end up with the same answer. No, it's thermal in the end. Yep, it's a very, it's a possibility, absolutely. Thank you. Um, really fantastic work. I'm actually really impressed with your own home-built <laughs> atom probe made of titanium. That's, you know, really, really difficult to do. And I also wanted to say some of my students have been telling me that they've been going through your YouTube channel and they appreciate your lecture th series on how to use how to use the software. So they've been they've been learning from that. And it's really good. Very good. <laughs> Does anyone anyone else have any questions? I have a question. What happens if you put titanium in your titanium atom probe? <laughs> Hydrogen. <laughs> well, um, it would. That doesn't make any difference. So uh, you would get the same uh, answer as with any other material in there. It's just with reduced hydrogen. There is no operational difference really. It's a. Uh, the only operational difference is that uh, the vacuum system is not as robust because you're limited to very specific types of pumps. Um, so you need to be a little bit more careful when you put your sample in, but I don't see any problem with uh, with doing with doing the titanium in there. Um, where we don't have enough data yet is what the fracture rate is. And the reason why we're worrying a little bit about that is because contamination can be good. Uh, um, because it uh, it lowers the evaporation threshold. So I do suspect that uh, we might get higher fracture rates in a regular atom probe, but so far we haven't really observed that too badly. Oh, super good. It's so cool. I want a titanium atom probe now. <laughs>
<laughs> well, the thing is, it's a drop in replacement and it's not even that expensive. I paid 20 grand for the titanium chamber and the, 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 the lids and everything. Uh, so that's about maybe twice or three times as much as stainless steel. It's absolutely not a factor in the cost of the instrument. So building the instrument costs about a half a million roughly um, because we went with everything full deluxe. You could do that much cheaper as well. Um, and uh, um, yeah, the, the titanium is not a factor in the pricing. What, um, what kind of, what is it, like TIE 6 or? No, it's all grade two. Cool. And did you machine it all in house, or did you? Did so the, ch you the chamber is uh, the chamber is made by a company in Italy that is special. They they make a lot of the titanium chambers for CERN and for uh, uh, for for our colleagues in uh, in the Bundesanstalt für Physik that have atomic clocks um, that have titanium chambers. Um, and all of the parts, all of the interior parts, are made by us. Machining titanium is not particularly hard. It's relatively easy. It's nice. Uh, if you don't care about tool wear, that is. <laughs> um, and um, the stage is made by Smorak, but I'm not quite sure if it would have made a difference if the stage is from, if like the, the piezo stage is from stainless steel, it would have probably been fine as well. Yeah, because I mean, I guess it's just straight in and out. You already have the, as long as Kamika are happy, you already have the design for it. You just need to switch out the material. Um, no, because the pumping scheme that Kamika uses is not really particularly uh, uh, applicable to this. Okay. Uh, because if you have a, uh, so if you, they're using a large iron getter pump, and the problem with a large iron getter pump is that eventually you go into an equilibrium uh, where the outgassing of the getter pump and the pumping of the getter pump get into an equilibrium, and you, you always get ions escaping from there. Yeah. And, uh, so this is the reason why I went with non-operative getter pumps, uh, where you don't have that issue. The problem uh, with the non-operative getter pumps is they're not really effective in pumping some of the longer chain contaminations as much. So you need to rely on the cryo for cryosorption, which works perfectly fine. It's just not as robust. So I'm not quite sure if you want to do that for a commercial atom probe. Yeah. I mean, you can. It's nothing <laughs> I'm doing it, but interesting. Well, thank you. <laughs> any other any other questions? No. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for for a great talk. And uh, yeah, hopefully we're going to be able to host you at some point soon um and and come to london and show you around we're having our own uh stuff installed by um by april actually so oh well, that, that went pretty quick it had to be epsrc <laughs> said we had to spend the money that fast <laughs> Fair enough. so uh yeah our our own atom probe is supposed to arrive in april and then you know the tm and the new fib as well so exciting Brilliant. And so looking forward to collaborating more in the future okay. then. So if you have anything with hydrogen that needs to be measured, you're always welcome in Erlangen as well. Oh, that would be exciting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's always always a need to find the hydrogen. Yes. yes. All right. Yeah. Um, Jess, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, so um, uh, once again, I uh, just want to say thank you for the talk. And yeah, looking forward for more updates and definitely we'll watch the the youtube videos that you suggested they sound really cool um yeah thank you everyone bye thank you thank you peter